Matthias Trum joins me this week to discuss smoked beer brewing. This is Beersmith Podcast number 268. This is Beersmith Podcast number 269, and it's late October 2022. Matthias Trum joins me this week to discuss smoked beer styles and brewing smoked beers. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, oil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And I launched a new version of the Beersmith Discussion Forum a few weeks ago, as well as made some significant security upgrades. The Beersmith Discussion Forum is a place where you can talk about all things brewing, including techniques, ingredients, equipment, pro-brewing, and our Beersmith Recipe software. Join the conversation today at beersmith.com slash forum. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Matthias Trum. Matthias is a sixth generation brewmaster and owner at Schlenkirla Brewery in Bamberg, Germany. He studied brewing science at the Weinsteffen uh, Brewing University and did his master's thesis on the history of brewing. Matthias, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Hi, Brad. Thank you for having me on the show. And uh, I must compliment you. Um, excellent pronunciation of my name and the <laughs> Schlenkele Brewery Tavern, which is quite a challenge at this early time of the day. Yeah, it's uh, it's morning here. It's a late afternoon in your place, I think, I believe, in yep. Germany. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your brewery in Bamberg, Germany? Well, Schlenkele is most known for its smoke beer. In German, they call it Rauchbier. So your uh, listeners might want to try to pronounce that, which is quite difficult for Americans. Rauchbier is a smoke beer in German. And uh, Schlenkele has been around for, for many centuries. And uh, we're basically the preserver of the old smoke beer uh, style, the, um, the original form of producing smoked malt. And everything about Schlenkel is about, about history. So when you travel to Bamberg, uh, Bamberg is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so a lot of traditional and historic uh, things there to see. And um, when you come to Schlenkel, it's basically like a little bit of a time travel, coming back to the old ages, to the middle ages, how beer was brewed back then, and also the interior. So um, it's it's really, really unique, I think, in, in the world. And some, some people refer to it as, as a temple of beer one should uh, have a pilgrimage to at one, one point. Well, I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember, I think you are built uh, over or under a church. Is that right? Something like that? <laughs> We're, we're pretty close to the Bamberg Cathedral. So Bamberg Cathedral is built on the Domberg, the Dome Hill, and that's about 200 meters from, from our brewery tavern. Yeah, oh, correct. Cool. And yeah. Uh, what size is the brewery? Um, it's a very small craft brewery, um, at least by American standards. So we do roughly 20,000 hectoliters a year. I think mm-hmm. a hectoliter is roughly a barrel in, in American calculations. And yeah. um, so a very small craft brewery. Um, the matter of the fact is that Bamberg here houses a lot of smaller breweries and uh, Bamberg County even more. Bamberg is part of Bavaria, the, the beer country, but what most people don't know is that the northern half of Bavaria is called Franconia. And in uh, Fra- Franconia, or Upper Franconia to be exact, there's a quarter of all German breweries. So we have more than uh, 200 breweries here in a very small area. And that combined with a relatively small population. So we have one brewery per 5,000 residents, which is the highest brewery density in the world. So um, a mecca to travel for for beer lovers. And I've been amazed at uh, how many businesses in Germany are family owned. Uh, a lot of the breweries are family owned. A lot of the malsters are family owned. A lot of the farmers are fam- farms are family owned. Uh, pretty interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I. I think it, it goes back to the the old uh, way the trade system worked in Germany. We very long had a guild system in which usually the um, um, the, the uh, business was passed on in the family, and also the government is going to cr uh, quite some some length to uh, preserve family businesses. So, for mm -hmm. instance, when a family business is inherited, um, there's certain uh, um, deductions on the inheritance tax you have to pay as long as you continue your business if you sell it out of course you have to pay the full taxes but if you continue it um, and in, especially if you keep the jobs in, in the business then usually you get a, a huge tax break yeah and i think that helps a lot to keep these old family businesses in operation <laughs> Well, um, you did your master's in brewing history, and uh, you may not know it, but I'm a big history fan myself. Um, cool. Perhaps you could share a bit of the history around smoked beer and how that style eventually came about. Well, uh, some 30 years ago or so, when you did uh, a city tour in Bamberg and you were asking that question to the city guide, they would tell you that in the Middle Ages, the brewery burned down and uh, the beer got smoked by accident. And <laughs> because people in Bamberg enjoyed that flavor, they were continuing to brew in that way, uh, which is a funny legend. And when you have this culture written city tours, it's of course funny to have an anecdote like is that. that. Uh, is that the same as the ghost tour, I guess? <laughs> Yeah, some, something like that, basically, <laughs> yeah. But of course, that's that's a myth and that's not the truth. Um, the, the truth is, in my opinion, even more interesting because as, uh, as uh, pointed out, I come from a history uh, point of view. Um, beer, together with bread, is the uh, oldest nourishment of mankind. So beer has been around for more than 10,000 years. And the basic principle of beer brewing has not changed in, in the last 10,000 years. So basically, it's a biochemical process in which um, the starch of the grain is transformed into sugars, and the sugars are then fermented by the yeast to alcohol and carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So that's the very basic principle. And in the production, always first you have to turn the grain into a malt, and then you can turn the malt into beer. And in the malting process, it is necessary to dry the malt at a certain stage. And originally, there were only two ways available of drying malt. Either you put it out in, uh, in, in the sun and you have it dry by the natural sun rays and by air. Or if you're living in a moister climate, um, you have to dry the malt over an open fire. And if you dry malt over an open fire, it's unavoidable that the smoke from that fire goes into the malt and gives the malt a smoky aroma and flavor. Mm. And the beer you brought, brew with such a made malt um, has a smoky aroma and flavor as well. And as in Central Europe, the uh, climate was moist most of the time. Um, all the beers being brewed in Central Europe had a more or less smoky flavor in the old days. So smoked beer, in fact, is the original form of making beer, at least here uh, in, in Europe, where, uh, where we have the moist climate. Um, the, and the modern style beer, which we know today, the smoke-free beer, uh, that's an invention of the industrialization in the 17th century um, that happened actually in Great Britain. Um, I think we can go more into the details later on. Yeah, I mean, but... I'd be interested in hearing about it. It's, I, I, Coke, uh, I think it was Coke malting, right, that introduced uh, uh, non-smoked malts, right? No, it was uh, the invention was uh, Sir, um, Sir Nicholas Hall's um, okay. of Cornwell. And he received his patent for the first non-smoke kiln back on uh, 23rd of July, 1635. Awesome. So almost uh, 400 years ago. And he mentioned as an alternative fuel to produce malt with his invention, sea coal. He, does, he doesn't actually men mention uh, a Coke, but yeah. of course that was used as well because it was cheap and easily available. So once it was possible to filter out the smoke prior to the actual kilning process, any fuel became an option. And nowadays, the modern malt houses, they run on gas or oil or maybe even el electricity, um, but they certainly don't run on, on open wood fire. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, I mean, that's, I mean, I find it interesting. So it wasn't until uh, that was the early 1600s. I don't think it was even widely used until the 1700s, really, right? That new method. <laughs> 
Exactly. And in, in England, the invention uh, um, was very much promoted uh, by uh, the, the crown, by the king, because England at the time was dependent on wood imports. Um, they would purchase wood from the Dutch and the Dutch, again, they uh, cut down trees in the Baltics and transported that over to England. So even back then, uh, um, the Western European countries, or at least England, were dependent on energy imports. So mm. it sounds very familiar to today's situation. <laughs> and of course, imports are bad and uh, protectionism was a, a, a topic at the time. So once this new technology was available and brewers were able to switch to a local fuel, say, coal mainly um, that was of course endorsed by by the officials and there was a secondary advantage as well um, the indirect kiln has a lower risk of, uh, of fire outbreaks in the brewery mm -hmm. so um, the, uh, the the breweries or um, um, the the officials the bureaucrats try to move the breweries relatively quickly to the new technology and i think it was like a century or so un until um, all the smoke kilns had been closed in england and the same happened later on in germany around 1800 the industrialization came to the continent from Great Britain, um, not only uh, the, uh, the brewing pro uh, process, but mainly the steam engine, the weaving stool, and all those inventions which, which made the industrialization possible. Factories were founded. And in Germany, the first brewery to close down its smoke kiln was uh, the Spaten Brewery of Munich, which you might have heard of, hmm, um, still of a big brewery, big brewery today. Uh, Georg Siedelmeier, he was the owner at the time. Uh, Georg Siedelmeier, the older, actually, there's a younger as well. And uh, he closed down, and I found this in old brewing books, he closed down his Bavarian kiln, meaning his smoke kiln. Mm -hmm. and replaced it with an English kiln, meaning a non-smoke kiln. So this new technology from England was so profound that it even uh, became a name carrier. So all these modern kilns were considered English kilns. And basically today, all the uh, malt houses in the world run on English kilns, meaning non-smoke kilns. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, I find it kind of interesting uh, historically that, you know, virtually all the beers prior to the 1700s or so were, were really smoked, right? Um, in, in principle, yes. Um, I think where beer was invented in the Mesopotamian area, mostly they would dry it uh, in the open sun. But even there um, in the country Jordan, there's excavation sites from 5,000 years ago from the Bronze Age um, in, in which you could find uh, kilns which were operated with open fire. Um, but it even goes beyond that. Not only the beer was uh, smoky, um, all the food was smoky because people were uh, preparing their food with open fire. Um, the fireplaces in the houses were, were smoky, of course. And um, there's another excavation site here from Germany that shows how the traditional housing at the time was. Um, people... So I'm talking about 3,000 years ago um, when the German tribes were, were living in, in, in the area, what today mm -hmm. is called Germany. And usually families, um, large family groups would live in a long house together. And this house had a uh, storage compartment adjacent to it. And uh, obviously at the time, whatever you harvested and collected in, uh, in, in fall would have to last you throughout the winter um, in, in food supply. There were no supermarkets or places where you can get food uh, un unless you snitch it from the neighbor or something. But um, essentially, um, what you had in fall had to last through winter. Otherwise, okay. you would starve to death. So it was absolutely important that your food, which you had collected, your grain, um, would not spoil over the winter, like mo uh, receive mold through moisture or something like that. So they went to a certain uh, effort to keep the storage facility dry as well. So um, what, what's been found in that excavation site is that usually the fireplace from the ma main house was connected by a canal in the floor with the storage compartment. And it's believed that... Um, the heat from uh, the, the fireplace and the smoke were channeled through that canal into the storage compartment in order to keep it dry and to prevent um, the food from, from rotting away. Smoke is a natural preservative. Yeah, it is. And 
And the positive side effect, I think, was that when you keep uh, the storage compartment uh, smoky, um, rodents are less likely to go in there because mice and rats, and they are afraid of fire, and where there's smoke, there's fire. So um, possibly you could keep your food uh, better, better stored in that way. So yes, everything was smoky at the time. Interesting. Um, well, uh, coming around to your brewery, your brewery has a unique history as well, going all the way back to, uh, I think 1405, you mentioned in at least one of the websites I found. Right, right. So 1405 is the first documentation of, of the building, actually. It was at the time, it was called the House of the Blue Lion. Um, when you look at the antler above the brewery entrance today, you find a lion uh, in, in, in the symbol in there. And uh, later on, it was referred to as the Brewery of the Blue Lion. And um, in 1485, for the first time, a beer-related uh, owner is documented. It was a cooper. Um, one has to know that in Bamberg, the coopers and the brewers were associated in the same guild. Hmm. Usually, brewers were making beer, and uh, uh, brewer um, coopers were making coopers barrels. Were, yeah. co cooper, exact coopers were making beer, and brewers were making barrels because it was an interconnected uh, business. And uh, the uh, official brewing record or the the actual documentation of beer being brewed is from from 1538. Um, later on, in 1678, uh, or in the, in the 17th century, the owners were the Heller family, which still is the official company name today, hmm. uh, Heller Brau. So you find that on our uh, bottle labels and on the website in the imprint and so forth. Sure. And in the 19th century, my family got in, so I'm the sixth generation, and uh, Konrad Graser was the first uh, member of my family to uh, run the brewery. And his son was the most famous member of uh, the family and gave the name to, to the tavern. So today it's called, the brewery and the tavern are called Schlenkala. Uh -huh. um, and Schlen Schlenkerla has a meaning. And uh, basically, uh, um, Andreas Graser, my great-great-grandfather, uh -huh. he had, uh, uh, according to legend, he had an accident in the brewery. We don't know exactly what happened, whether he drank too much or whether uh, the brewery horses stepped on his toe or whether he fell over a wooden barrel. But he was limping afterwards. And when when you limp, you dangle your arms to keep the balance, like when you, when you weaver sure, your sure. arms. And in German, when you walk like that, this is called Schlenkern. Um, also, like a drunk person might walk uh, when, when they dangle their way home. Interesting. So um, the, uh, the regulars at the tavern gave my ancestor uh, the name Schlenkerla, which means the, uh, the, the little dangler, yeah? the person who walks in, in, in such a way. <laughs> and uh, al almost like an Indian name in a way, right? When you, when you have this description, a descriptive name of what a person is doing, yeah. basically. So Schlenkela was the person, and people said, let's go to Schlenkela tonight, and they meant um, the patron, my, my ancestor. Uh -huh. But over time, that became synonymous for the brewery, for the tavern, and eventually for the smoke beer. So today, mm -hmm. Schlenkela equals smoke beer, and smoke beer equals Schlenkela. Awesome. Um, can you give us a little bit of the history of, of modern smoked beer? Obviously, uh, you know, as we talked about a minute ago, all beer was smoked at one time. But um, how, what is modern smoked beer like and how does it differ from perhaps the historical smoked beer? So uh, today there's two producers left that do the traditional smoked beer. One is Schlenkela and the other one is Spezial here in, in, in Bamberg, mm -hmm. uh, the Spezial Brewery. We both still run our historic smoke kilns, as I've described before. And uh, basically what we did, we never switched to modern technology. So we're dinosaurs, if you will. So do you, um, do you make your own malt then, I guess? Yeah. Uh, for yeah. the, for the, at least the smoke malt. I don't know if you buy the base malt, but... Um, well, we get into that later on. We don't okay. need much base malt, but uh, yes, if we do need base malt for something, then we buy it elsewhere. But okay. the smoke malt is our base malt. Okay. Yeah, it, it's the majority of portion in, in all the beers we do, and uh, most of them actually have 100% smoke malt. But we can talk more about awesome. that later. Um, modern smoke beers are a little bit an invention of the craft beer revolution, which started in the 1980s in, in the Americas sure. and uh, swept across the globe. And there's a lot of countries nowadays with small craft breweries. And um, I don't know exactly how it went, but 
basically um, with the bigger diversity in breweries, there was a need for a bigger diversity in brewing styles. Um, mm -hmm. I think America um, in the 1980s, before the first craft breweries opened, was relatively boring regarding beer diversity. I, I, I can vouch for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mostly pay loggers. And it was, uh, I mean, really, uh, if you go to the supermarket, it was almost 100% like Bud Miller, you know, uh, pale, pale adjunct lager was pretty much it. So. Yeah, some so some traditional Germans would consider this a horror trip, but okay, that's a different story. Well, yeah, it, <laughs> some of us too, but. <laughs> so um, once these breweries were there, they were, of course, looking what they could do. And uh, one very famous style they do today, and basically all every, every craft brewery has it, was uh, IPA, which is a historic beer style, in essence, from, from, from England. Yeah. And... Um, Obviously, they would look for other styles as well. So they uh, quickly they discovered that there was something called smoke beer in the old days, and um, so the modern craft breweries wanted to do smoke beer as well. And uh, my father actually told me that we've been approached in the 1980s by various breweries from the United States that wanted to purchase our smoke malt because there was no commercial smoke malt at the time, mm -hmm. um, and we neither had the capacity nor uh, the intention of selling our well secret ingredient if you will there's a lot of family knowledge in there so and uh -huh. we, we, we we don't consider ourselves to be a commercial malt house so we only produce for our own own need and um so the other supply option were some whiskey distilleries in scotland that still do uh peat smoked malt uh -huh. but, which is much uh, different i think right which is different uh, in flavor, but not in principle of production. Yeah. Um, but the flavor is a totally different different story, of course. And as economies work, uh, when there's a demand, somebody's going to supply it. So the uh, big industry maltings, the uh, commercial malt houses, they found a way of producing smoke malt on a larger scale mm -hmm. uh, and in a cheaper fraction. And um, so nowadays you can purchase a smoke malt from a number of uh, big suppliers. And um, also, I think some craft brewers are experimenting with smoking malt themselves. Of course, yeah. So what usually what they would do is take a finished malt and smoke it afterwards, um, which yields in, in a decent smoky flavor. And uh, quality wise, it's not better or worse than the original thing. But taste wise, of course, it's a different different story. So it's a, f a question of personal preference, which which you prefer. Mm -hmm. And um uh, but in the original form um, of producing it, the smoking um, is actually the side effect. Like the, the main reason why we burn the fire under the kiln is in order to dry the malt. And the fact that the smoke goes in there is just something we cannot avoid. And um, so uh, it's, it's a, a different aim in the production. So we don't try to maximize the smoke flavor or to, to generate a certain... Uh, in there so it's all about killing the malt and smokiness is a side effect so and um, because there's only two producers left in the world that do it in the original form um, it's uh, something of a uh, well minority if you will and um, the uh, organization slow food from Italy uh, who dedicated themselves uh, to preserve old-style foods. They made Schlenkerle and Spezial passengers of the Ark of Taste in 2017 because uh, whenever there's only a, f a handful of producers left of a certain historic food, they consider that food to be in the risk of uh, becoming extinct. And sure. therefore, the Ark of Taste, which of course is a uh, um, reminiscence of the Ark uh, of Noah, where uh, the animals were rescued, and Slow yeah. Food wants to rescue old vegetables, old uh, old food recipes, and uh, the traditional smoked beer cool. now is in there. Personally, I don't have the feeling that I'm close to extinction. I feel quite alive. That's but, good. Uh, good. <laughs> also, the brewery does. So. Well, um... So, is if I buy smoked malt from a large maltster, is it is it made in the in the traditional way, or is it not? It sounds like it's not. It's probably smoked after the fact, huh? I don't know exactly how the big places are doing it, but our smoke kiln has a capacity of roughly four tons of malt, uh -huh. and the industrial producers, their uh, uh, germination boxes and their kilns are way bigger. Yeah, obviously. And 
uh, I don't think that you can run that on on, on wood. So uh, yeah. they they have to use some form of flavoring technology, whatever that is. Yeah. And um, so I assume they're probably probably likely not drying the uh, the malt out over a wood fire, right? I very much doubt that it yeah, wouldn't wouldn't yeah. be possible. No, it's it's a, a smoke flavor, a smoke flavoring thing, which again, from a quality point of view, I, I'm I'm sure that's all okay because they of course yeah, have of course, to follow yeah. the food laws and all that. Yeah. But it's just a diff a different approach. It's going to have a different different uh, flavor and complexity to it. Um, exactly. So can you talk about how you actually uh, make your malt there? You have to do the malting in house, so I assume you have to uh, sprout the seed and everything, right? Yes, um, we have uh, the the entire process in in, in our home uh, in our brewery. So um, we we do the steeping, the the germination, the drying of the malt, and um, so we are we are full flagged uh, malt house in that respect. Yep. Awesome. Um, can you talk a little bit about the style? I know you have some variations. For example, in smoke style, a lot of people think, oh, oh, it's just one style, but it's really a whole bunch of sub styles, right? Well, as as I, um, as we've talked about, um, the malt is is killed over an open fire. So with that malt, you can, in theory, do any beer. Um, uh, from a historic point of view, of course, not all the styles were available in Germany. So we don't have a smoked IPA at Schlenkela because uh, IPA is not a traditional not, yeah. German style. Um, we do have uh, the classic smoked beer, which is a Merzen style beer, uh, meaning it's a little bit higher in original gravity because in the very old days, um, at least outside Bamberg, those beers were brewed in the month month of March, which in German is called Merz, um, mm -hmm. to last throughout the summertime with a higher alcohol ratio. In Bamberg, uh, there's a, a particular story on that, that all the Bamberg beers were a little bit higher in alcohol because that's what Bamberg was famous for. So the Merzen style beer were, were brewed all throughout the year in, in Bamberg. And the term Merzen didn't come up to like 150 years ago. So this is the classic uh, Rauch beer as we have been brewing it for centuries. And it's actually done with 100% smoke malt. So uh, smoke malt really is the base malt. <laughs> um, then we have a stronger version, a Bach beer version from from uh, the classic uh, Rauch beer, which is an Urbock. Um, you've, I suppose you know the term Bach beer. Yeah, of course. Uh, which is synonymous to strong beer. Um, this goes back to the city of Einbeck in Germany that also used to have stronger beer all the time because they were doing a lot of exports. And um, um, Einbeck got transferred into to Bock beer over time by, by, by the vernacular. Mm -hmm. And by calling it Ur Bock, Ur is the German version of o original or the, the, the at the beginning. Yeah, the the Uran is uh, Uran is the great grandfather uh, or the great ancestor. So at the beginning stands the Ur. Um, so the Ur bog is the original form of bog beer again because it's smoked. Uh, because the original bog beers all would have been smoked to right, a certain extent. Right, right, right. That's cool. Um, uh, then we have a smoked wheat beer. Mm -hmm. um, which is a blend of regular not smoked wheat malt and our smoked barley malt. Mm -hmm. um, the wheat beer actually just won a gold medal at the European Beer Star Awards oh, as awesome. the best smoked beer. Um, then we have uh, a summer beer, is a Kreuzen, that's a blend between a pale lager and our classic Merzen. We have a pale lager, which is not brewed with smoked malt, but with standard malt but still has a certain smoky flavor to it because it's fermented by yeast, which has been in smoked beer before. Hmm. Um, so some people refer to it as the homeopathic smoked beer because it just gets that little idea of smokiness inside. <laughs> and all these beers, all these malts now uh, have been made with beechwood smoked malt. So beechwood was the common. So I, I, is that true? All, all of your malts are, are smoked over beechwood then? Um, all but one. Okay. Um, uh, there's also uh, something which I introduced some, when was that, 13, 13 14 years ago. Um, because in the old days, obviously, not everything was done with one type of wood. Right. And um, I was looking in old archives and stuff, and I found that often uh, oak was used as well. Interesting. Um, 
so we we did a a, a sample batch and a trial batch uh, of in our malt house and dried it over uh, oak oak wood and at first i thought that the color would be darker and that the smoke would be more intense because the the wood is so much harder than beech wood yeah um but it actually turned out to be the opposite it was smoother in smokiness and the color was a bit little bit lighter huh. and that uh, smooth smokiness was in my opinion perfect for bock beer uh, double bock to uh, to be exact. So uh, we introduced uh, the Schlenkeler Eiche. Eiche is the German word for oak, uh, which is a doppelbock we, we have here uh, at Christmas time or for, for the winter season with 8% alcohol. And um, I think in the United States it's available all year round because our uh, importer stocks pi stockpiles a bit and uh, the uh, Eiche actually also won a gold medal at the european beer star uh, as the best strong, strong smoke beer so we're a uh, double gold winner there and the most successful brewery in the smoke beer section which i think shows that the traditional way of doing smoke malt has certain advantages over the modern type <laughs> awesome. and um so yeah that's the oak smoke and um, the latest edition is something a little bit, well, different in a way. Um, again, in old records, I found that one third of the Bamberg beer production or, or, or the brewery production of Bamberg breweries was not beer, uh, but a low alcohol uh, product they called Hansler or Heinzlein at the time. Hmm. So... Uh, you have to keep in mind that in 19, up till the 19th century, there was no sewage system and no high quality water. So all the waters potentially uh, were polluted with uh, bacteria and germs and pathogens. So whenever possible, people would drink beer because beer was brewed sure. in the production process and hops is a bacteriostatic and the fermentation will bring down the uh, pH level. Right. The acid acidity, which again prevents uh, bacteria from growing. So beer was back then the safe choice. Now, when you drink beer all throughout the day and you have to follow your daily chores or your work uh, and you're drunk, that obviously uh, doesn't work. So people would drink during the day a um, beer with less alcohol. In sure. the monasteries, they had something called Kofent. Um, which was around 2% alcohol, uh, it's as estimated today. Uh, but the Bamberg Brewers had uh, something very particular. They, they uh, did a special double brewing system um, in which they um, basically reused the malt from a previous batch and did a secondary beer out of that, and thereby de uh, uh, decreasing the uh, alcohol rate in the beer. So it was a different laudering technique, a different mashing technique. And um, I found this in old records, in old family records, and we did a trial run. It actually turned out to have uh, less than 1% alcohol. It's 0.9% uh, in alcohol, and you mm. can basically drink, drink it like an alcohol-free beer because alcohol-free beers have up, up to 0.5% alcohol. Correct, so yeah. this is only uh, a little bit above it. And so we introduced that, reintroduced that three years ago um, as the Schlenkeler Hansler, uh, which is uh, this low alcohol version. And because it had quite a good success and reception here in the market. We actually also introduced a non-smoky version of that called Heinzlein. Mm -hmm. um, so this is like the local uh, office beer and sports people beer, and it's a very nice Bamberg nice. edition. Nice, nice. It's not awesome. exported. Though. It's it's just a local thing. It's not exported. Well, unfortunately, we're already running a little bit low on time, but I did want to get to one topic that I think is very important, and that's you know how do you get the smoke balance right um, with with malt uh, with with a beer? You know, a lot of us have tried to make uh, smoked beers, and we end up maybe putting too much smoke in it, or or too much small malt malt in it. I think a lot of the commercial malts are perhaps a little stronger than what you're using as a base. Um, how do you get that right and balance it against things like color and the strength of the beer and so on? Well, for the traditional Schlenkeler styles, I actually cannot answer that because um, it's this was done. <laughs> first of all, that, and second of all, this was done hundreds of years ago. So the uh, the water and malt ratio and how much hops we're add, adding, this is all uh, all old family recipes, and I haven't changed <laughs> anything about that. So um, a couple of hundred years ago, some people must have been really smart. Somebody got it right. Yeah. yeah, somebody got it right. We just continue that. No, um, with uh, with the modern versions uh, or the modern introductions of mine or the reinterpretations, the oak smoke and and, and beers like that, um, 
basically the smokiness comes from the malt as it is because as i was pointing out earlier on we uh, burn the fire to dry the malt and we don't want to reach a certain smokiness level in there it's just a smokiness which uh, which it has so you have to come from another end you have to work with a uh, with a mashing technology um what kind of decoction mesh are you using you have to think of what hops are you using how strong, uh, how much hops are you using and with that you you have to make the the the, the balance but not through the malt bill of say uh okay i add a little bit less of our smoke malt and i replace that with uh, another base malt hmm. that's not not the way uh we're, we're doing it and yeah. in- interestingly enough the smokiness is relatively stable between batches there's a little bit of difference between summer and winter time obviously because in the winter you need more wood mm-hmm. but um it's it's relatively stable so my my take on that is that uh, uh, in our case, usually the, the grain is saturated with the smoke to a certain level, and it doesn't really make a difference on, on, on how intense the, the kiln is burning. And I mean, are you doing a traditional decoction mash? What are, what are some of the other production techniques you're using for your beer? Um, all decoction mash, as you pointed out, double decoction usually. Double, okay. Um, Double decoction. Uh, we have a classic copper vessel brew house. Um, wow. The um, the brewing kettle is actually a direct fired kettle, as it was in the old days. So no steam or uh, hot water templates or stuff like that. It's a real direct uh, fire underneath, which cool. I think uh, um, adds a lot of caramel, uh, caramelization Character, yeah, effect. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, that's the thing. Then um, we still have two vessel uh, production, meaning um, separate fermentation and lagering vessels, so not one vessel production, Mm -hmm. which I think uh, uh, brings a certain extra to the flavor. And most importantly, we lager the beer in our historic rock cellars with the uh, natural cool environment down there and for a very long time. Um, the classic Mertzen smoke beer has two months of lagering time and the oak smoke have uh, up to half a year of lagering time. And that really gives that ex- extra smooth, uh, balanced uh, taste and flavor to it. Awesome. Um, well, you do offer a wide variety of products through your website and including, I, I think you ship some, you do some shipping, at least in, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, you have distilled essence, you have smoke beers and a wide variety of things. Can you mention your website and also your location for those that might be traveling to Bamberg? Well, the website is fairly easy found. It's smokebeer.com. And uh, in the menu, then you find a, a shop button. Or when you want to go directly, it's shop.schlenkeler.com. Sure. Uh, shop.schlenkeler.de, sorry. Uh, but for legal reasons, we can ship alcohol only within the European Union. So yeah. we cannot ship directly to the US. Customs won't let it through. But we have some merchandise for um, Schlenker lovers in the United States, like T-shirts and stuff. So um, <laughs> that can actually be shipped over. And I think our U.S. importer also has a small online store. Uh, BeUnited.com is their website. So is, um, your, is your beer available in the U.S. through, through an importer anywhere? Yeah. Um, the company is called BeUnited, and they sell actually, I think, in almost all the states. Mm-hmm. Um, so you should be able uh, to find it uh, close to you through Be United. They can give you the local distributor. Awesome. Um, but you you find it in most places. Whole food markets uh, sometimes have it, and uh, beer specialty beer specialty stores usually have it. So you can find it there. Um, our U.S. importer has a very special thing, which might be interesting uh, for you as well. Um, they have uh, not only for us, but for all their suppliers, a tank container project. What they're doing is they have uh, uh, cooled tank containers, which they can send to breweries around the world and pick up the beer in the tank container there. Um, So in in essence, these are movable lagering vessels. And once in the United States, um, those, uh, the the beer from those tank containers is then filled into uh, uh, barrels or into cans. Mm-hmm. So when, when you find Schlenkele in cans, that's something exclusive to the United States, and it's uh, from uh, Be United. Uh, and all these cans are unfiltered. So the freshness is just awesome compared to, to other imported products because the time in the tank container uh, does not 
have an effect as a shipping time because it's the same or similar to when it stays in the brewery. So um, when you find a can from Schlenkele, usually it's only like two or three weeks old, which wow. is relatively close to the flavor you get here in Germany. That's awesome. Well, um, I wanted to get your closing thoughts, especially uh, have you got any advice for people that uh, that are interested in making smoked beer at home maybe and um, and maybe talk a little bit about your thoughts as a, as a sixth generation brewer of smoked beer? Well, I'm, I'm always happy when people look into the smoked beer style and try it at home themselves. And um, you can put it in your home smoker. You can experiment with various uh, types of woods. And I think all those will result in, a, in, in an interesting flavor. Just keep in mind um, that in the original form, it means that you actually kill the malt all the way with, with the wood, which is something uh, right. you will have a hard time doing yourself. Um, the, the important thing for me is to uphold these, this old tradition and to preserve it for the coming generations. Um, the seventh generation is already running around. My son is 11, my daughter, the, she's eight. And um, they're, they're both very proud to come from a brewery. And um, so hopefully one of them will continue the business one day and uh, uphold the traditions. And um, what maybe expresses best what, what we're doing at Schlenkala is a proverb, which I found on the internet. It's, I don't know, Chinese or something. I didn't make it up myself. It basically says um, preservation, the tradition means to not keep the ashes or store the ashes. It means to keep the, the fire burning. And I think in a very literal meaning, that is what we're doing at the Schlenkala malting. So I think um, by keeping the kiln in operation, we're in the best possible ways preserving the old tradition of smoked beers well matthias it's it's been great chatting with you today and uh, unfortunately we spent so much time on history we didn't get in, as far into the brewing as i'd like but um but i'm always interested in history and obviously uh, uh very core to your business um i'd love to have you on again though if you'd like to come on again sometime and talk about uh, a little more on the brewing side but thank you so much for being a guest today i really appreciate it Thank you very much for the patience. I know history is sometimes a little bit of a dry topic, but I think with a, with beer in, in combination, beer can be very uh, smooth and sailing and uh, easy drinking thing. So thank you very much for having me. Well, I, I actually enjoy the history and uh, really enjoyed hearing your story, especially as a sixth generation brewer of, uh, of a very rare beer. You mentioned only two uh, commercial breweries left in Germany making it. Um, right. So Matthias, uh, thank you again for, for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care. My guest today was Matthias Trum. He is a sixth generation brewmaster and owner of Schlenkerle Brewing in Bamberg, Germany. Thank you again. Thank you, Brad. A big thank you to Matthias Trum for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the Brew House Controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with a new Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit blickmanengineering.com. Again, that's blickmanengineering.com. And I launched a new version of the Beersmith Discussion Forum a few weeks ago, as well as made some significant security upgrades. The Beersmith Discussion Forum is a place where you can discuss all things brewing, including techniques, ingredients, equipment, pro brewing, and our Beersmith recipe software. Join the conversation today at beersmith.com slash forum. Again, that's beersmith.com slash forum. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great Brewing Week.